What do punk, goth, shoegaze and dream pop have in common? Well, except for all of them being amazing genres, they can all be traced back to one band, and that band's name is The Velvet Underground. I know I tend to exaggerate things a lot on this channel, but The Velvet Underground might generally be one of the most important bands in music history, and it's amazing how influential they are, considering that when they were active, they could barely sell 30,000 records. They are the definition of, in case you guys aren't ready for this, that your kids are gonna love it. Without repeating myself too much, make sure to like and subscribe if you're into world music, and enjoy. This is the story of The Velvet Underground, and how they became the most important underground band in music history. Okay, for this story, we need to travel back to 1950s New York, more than 70 years ago. The Reed family had just moved to a suburb in Long Island, when our protagonist was only 9 years old. Lou Reed, being the youngest brother of the family, started getting into music pretty early in his life. While growing up, Lou took some guitar and piano lessons, but unfortunately none of his teachers could teach him what he needed to learn, because Lou wanted to be a rock and roll star. So much so, that he made his first record when he was only 14 years old, called Leave Her For Me. That record made him a grand total of $2.79, but obviously this was just the beginning. During his teenage years, Lou kept practicing with his guitar, and later, he started playing in gay bars. Now, before getting into the dark history of Lou Reed's sexuality, and how that affected his life in 50s America, we need to talk about John Cale's dark, dark life. Cale was born on March 9th of 1942, in a very nationalistic Welsh house. Despite this house being so nationalistic, Cale's dad was an Englishman, and a miner. The cave kind, not the drake kind. Even though his dad was English, Kale didn't learn the English language until 7 years old because of his nationalist grandma who had banned the language at her house. This caused him to not be able to speak to his dad at all during his developing years. Later, his mom got sent to a hospital for an operation and during this time, Kale started to get very isolated since he couldn't really speak to anyone. This caused him to get molested by a priest at the age of 12 and him not telling anybody. Now, why am I bringing this whole thing up? Because I think the fact that both him and Lou Reed had a really terrible upbringing caused for the Velvet Underground to get the dark sound that it got. And that is what made the Velvet Underground, the Velvet Underground. That is also what made Lou and John connect so much with each other. Anyways, we are still in 50s Wales and John Cale started learning the viola and got into Bach and classical music. Which, if you're a fan of the band, you know that this is very important. John, with a big desire of leaving the small town he was raised in, got more into classical music and decided to move to New York to become a conductor. Now this is where our story begins. It is 60s New York and pretty soon a little thing called hippies are gonna start to appear everywhere. John had just joined the theater of eternal music and he and his friends were basically the complete opposite of hippies. If hippies talked about how beautiful life is and smoked weed and whatever the fuck they did, John's music talked about the darkest part of life. Because of this, he started getting into a little something called avant-garde music, which would become the key element of the first two Velvet Underground albums. But before we start talking about the band, we have to talk about Lou's sexuality and the way his parents dealt with it. It was 60s New York, and despite the average person being really homophobic, Lou got into the underground scene where he met John Cale and eventually Andy Warhol. Being in this scene, Lou started experimenting both sexually and musically, but most importantly, he started experimenting with drugs. Lou was at a really dark point of his life and his parents found out that he was gay. And you know what they did? They tried to cure his gayness with electroshock therapy. Now when they asked his sister about this, she got really defensive and claimed that it was a lie. But that is genuinely what Lou believed at the time. Now, is that really what happened? Well, some people say that his sexuality didn't have anything to do with his electroshock therapy and he was just depressed. Some people say it's partly the reason. But me personally, I don't think it's that impossible. Even if he didn't get electroshocked because he was gay, his parents clearly didn't support him, and that made him want to rebel even more. It is pretty clear from his career that he didn't really care about what other people thought, and he would always do what he wanted. That is the sole reason why his career is so rich. Anyways, after ditching college for a second time, Lou started working at Pickwick Records as a songwriter. There, he and all the other musicians that worked there would just mass produce records in the hope that some of them would do good because they were really cheap to make. During this time, he made a record called The Ostrich, which despite its nonsensical lyrics, some consider it to be as an early form of garage rock. 
the ostrich surprisingly got some traction, and Pickwick Records had presented it under the name of the Primitives. There was a slight problem with this though, seeing as the Primitives wasn't a real band, and they had to quickly find some members because they had to perform at an air dance party. Eventually, they found some people to join, but among those people was the one and only John Cale. Despite Lou being called initially, the two eventually became friends after he showed John some of his demos. John didn't really like them, but he could tell that there was a potential there. After a while, he got more into Lou's work and started understanding it. Lou's lyrics were dark and graphic at a time where those topics had absolutely no chance of being into songs. He talked about heroin and sadomasochism and degrading sex. His lyrics were rough because that is the life he lived. John, considering his troubled past and the way he even lived now, fell in love with those lyrics. Lou tried to pitch these songs to record labels, but obviously they didn't like them. They were too challenging for them. There was no way in hell these songs would be played in the radio. So John had the genius idea of helping Lou record these songs. He also had the even more genius idea of matching these dark and challenging lyrics with equally dark and challenging music. Eventually, Sterling Morrison and Angus MacLeese joined the band, and The Velvet Underground was born. The Velvet Underground being born was something magical for Lou Reed, because after years of working for shitty companies, he could finally make the songs he wanted to make. He could finally talk about his life and show people the other side of music, a darker side that they had never seen before. The band started working on their first songs, like Hitman and Venus in Furs, and Lou's lyrics combined with John Cale's genius instrumentals really created an atmosphere that was never seen before in rock and roll. They started doing some live performances, and Lou and John would just go crazy and come up with lyrics and instrumentals on the spot just to enhance this atmosphere that they were going for. But to their surprise, people didn't like them. I mean, looking back at it now, you could see how some folks in the 60s wouldn't be into that type of music. But this was New York. They had created a completely new genre of music, and people just didn't seem to care. Maybe they were just too scared to listen to music that talked about the real parts of life. Anyways, the band wasn't a total failure because they had managed to impress one very important person, Andy Warhol, the king of pop art. Andy invited them to his studio, The Factory, to show him their work, and they played for him live. Of course, being an open-minded artist, Andy was amazed, and he helped the band get signed to MGM's Verve Records with the premise that he was going to be one of their producers. Andy didn't really help with the music, he actually caused them some trouble later, but for now, this meant that the band could actually exist while making the records they wanted to make. Despite this wonderful opportunity the band got, there was a small problem. The factory was a multimedia studio, and Andy Warhol had cameras running all day long. This didn't only mean that the band would get very uncomfortable, but it also meant that random people would just come into the factory with the hopes of getting famous through Andy Warhol. The tales of this factory got so big that it even reached a certain German singer slash actress, Nico. Nico came down to New York and started visiting the factory, and for some reason, Andy got this idea that the Velvet Underground wasn't good enough because they needed a pretty face for people to see. Lou and John weren't good enough for Andy apparently. They also needed a random girl that they never talked to before to truly reach that commercial success. Luckily for the band, Nico's voice was pretty good. The addition of Nico and the band getting signed finally meant that they could start working on their debut album, The Velvet Underground and Nico. Sunday March 12 of 1967, the band released The Velvet Underground and Nico, and similarly to their live performances, it didn't do that well. Despite now having Nico as the face of the band, radio stations would just refuse to play songs like Heaven and Venus in Furs. In its first five years, the album only sold 30,000 copies, but as Brian Eno famously said, everyone who bought one of those 30,000 copies started the band. Now some people hear this quote and say, how was this album so influential if they could barely sell any copies? Well as I said before, The Velvet Underground did something that was never seen before. They combined avant-garde music with rock and roll and used it to describe the gritty parts of life. This was the 60s, but even at that time you had artists like Bob Dylan or The Beatles who challenged their listeners by making songs with more nuanced lyrics and emotions. Now Lou Reed got that and took it to the extreme. He talked about the ugly part of 60s New York. He didn't care if it was going to be played on the radio. He wanted to turn his gritty literature into a rock and roll song. This attitude of his is what inspired a lot of punk bands that were going to come out during the 70s. But this wasn't all. The Velvet Underground and Nico ended up becoming such an important album 
because it did everything that all the other bands weren't doing. It wasn't melodic, it wasn't meant to be commercial, the guitars weren't toned, it sounded gritty and rough, but it worked. In the end of the day, the album turned out to be amazing, and it still holds up to this day. Despite not doing well commercially, it gave its few listeners a completely different way of approaching music. Those distorted guitars ended up not only influencing punk, but shoegaze and dream pop as well, and loose dark music and lyrics influenced a lot of early god bands. It's hard to explain to people that these guys were one of the first ever bands to experiment with music like this, because they didn't just create a unique sound for their band, they genuinely opened the doors for so many different genres. I think Lou Reed and John Cale knew that what they were doing was important, and it must have been devastating to see that people just didn't care about them at the time. Anyways, Andy Warhol ended up hosting a bunch of festivals and concerts with the band, where he would also invite dancers and visual artists and create a proper atmosphere to fit their music. Also, I forgot to mention, the cover of the first album was a banana that would turn into a penis. Very epic. The band started touring, they would mostly play in art museums and stuff like that, and they would just make people leave. I'm not gonna talk too much about that part, but I just wanna point out that they toured on the west coast, and they were there, they just had to deal with hippies, which the band absolutely hated. This love, peace, crap, we hated that. Get real. Everybody wants to have a peaceful world and not get get uh, shot in the head or something, but you cannot change minds by handing a flower to some bozo who wants to shoot you. Do something. Do something about it. Don't walk around uh, with your flowers in your hair. It's so funny, but I agree with them 100%. Anyways, after a horrible tour with some nasty reviews, the band was ready to work on their second album, White Light, White Heat. This time, there was a slight difference. Lou fired both Andy Warhol and Nico. Throughout his career, Lou always kind of had a big ego, which worked in his favor, because if he didn't do what he wanted to do, that he wouldn't have that amazing first album. The problem was that this ego crashed with the other members of the band, specifically John Cale and Nico. For now, Lou was in good relations with John, because well, he was the voice of the band. But then Nico came on, and she became the face of everything and Lou just got annoyed with her. This was his band and his ideas and he was making something special and then she just comes on and joins the band because of Andy Warhol. Also, Nico was just a genuinely unlikable person. There's a story of her meeting Paul McCartney and telling him in his face that she didn't like his part in A Day in a Life. After that, Paul still let her stay at his house until he eventually had to kick her because she was staying there for weeks. Also, pretty sure she was violently racist, but I don't have enough evidence to prove that. The point is that nobody really wanted her there, except Andy for some reason. Andy wanted the band to be a commercial success, so he sat down with Lou and told him, do you want to just keep playing museums and art festivals, or do you want to start moving into other areas? Think about it. Lou thought about it and fired him. Thankfully, because of Andy, the band still had access to Vox equipment and they could start working on their second album. Because of this free access, they just went crazy with it. White Light got the rough part of the first album and just took it to the max. It was pure noise and it was beautiful. This album also ended up becoming a crucial part of what was gonna turn into shoegaze. But for now, it did even worse than the debut album. This was starting to get into Lou's mentality. Because as much as he didn't care about anything, he still wanted the band to be successful. All of the members were under a lot of stress, which affected the music a lot and most of them were on in anyways. All this tension finally exploded and Lou decided to also kick John Cale from the band. The two did get back together in 1990 after Andy Warhol's death to make the album Songs for Drella, which was a tribute to Andy's work. But for now, John was out of the band. After being tired of the little success the band was reaching, Lou decided to go down the pop route and he was damn good at it. Because of this desire to make the band more accessible, the band started working on their third album. The Velvet Underground. You blue eyes. By the way, this is the second out of the three self-titled albums of the band. They really didn't get creative with the names. The Velvet Underground, the album, started an unknowing trend on Lou Reed's career, and that trend was the constant need for experimentation. Now this is ironic seeing that this album was the least experimental work the band had done. But this was the first time where you could see that Lou could not stick to one singular genre. He needed to constantly change his music, constantly evolve, or he would get sick of it. This trend was even more obvious in his solo career, but for now, 
It's 1969, and the band wants to make songs that the average person can actually listen to. They started working on the album by replacing John Cale with Doug Yule. The desire to reach some commercial success led to the band putting more focus on Lou Reed singing and having simpler and more peaceful instrumentals. As a result of all of this, we got a more personal and emotional album that really highlighted Lou's greatness. The album included some amazing songs like Candy Says, Pale Blue Eyes and After Hours, which sound so weirdly modern despite their simplicity and they're some of the band's biggest songs today. Also, I want to talk a little about Candy Says because it's actually a song about a trans girl being uncomfortable in her own body and trying to escape her birth gender. Now you might think, how come Lou Reed in the 60s is more progressive than the average person now? Well I think Candy Says shows that trans people weren't seen in a negative light back then. Of course, they weren't universally accepted because the average person didn't know they existed, but some of them were generally more accepted than they are now. You can go back and find interviews with trans women in the 50s and 60s and you could see that the hosts are actually very respectful and gender affirming surgeries were seen as an amazing development in our technology. Now what about dates? You have dates with men. Do you ever have dates with men who don't know that you're a man? Most of the times they don't. And what do they do when they find out? Well, they don't really care. You said that you're a trans woman. I trans female, yes, ma'am, sir. Do you have a penis? The contrast between those interviews and the way we see trans people now really shows us how fascism works in the modern days. I know to some of you it sounds like a reach, but trans people are depicted as these freaks who are destroying modern day society, and the average conservative thinks they're this big threat when they make up less than 1% of the population. This method of just blaming a minority group was used in a certain European country in the 1940s that I'm not gonna mention here. Anyways, sorry for the rant, but I think Candy says it's pure genius because Lou was generally more open-minded in the 60s than like half of America now. Despite this pure genius and the fact that the album is so dearly loved now, at the time, this album did even worse than the first two albums in the charts. The band thankfully did not stop trying though. The next to the album was gonna be another change of genres, but before that, we have to talk about the beloved compilation album, VU. This is the third self-titled album I was talking about by the way. Also, Alex Turner got the idea of naming AM from this very album. Now, VU isn't really a groundbreaking album because, well, it wasn't even meant to be an album in the first place. The band kept touring in America and Canada, and after they released a studio album in 1969, they started working on some new songs. Now, these songs would be performed on and off studio, and some of the songs of this era ended up on Loaded, like Rock and Roll and Sweet Jane, but some of them ended up on VU. VU wasn't released to the public until 1985 but it's still a really important part of the band's history because it shows the transition between the Grey album and Loaded. Also, it's a pretty good fucking album. It includes songs like I Can't Stand It, Stephanie Says and I'm Sticking With You, which is used in Juno. But enough talking about VU because we need to get to the most rock and roll part of the band's history. Their last true album, Loaded. <laughs> Loaded starts off pretty unfortunately, with Maureen Talker getting replaced on drums, because she was pregnant. Maureen was a really important part of the band, and she even did the vocals on After Hours, but unfortunately, the band decided to go on without her, because they didn't know this was gonna be their last album. The album had a pretty similar goal to their last studio album, that goal being commercial success, but with a little small difference. Loaded was pure rock and roll. This album is probably the band's easiest album to get into, but I personally think that it's still great. I'm not really a big fan of classical rock, but Loaded has so much personality to it, because it was basically Lou's album. He was in charge, and he got to show off his amazing songwriting. Yeah, he can write songs like or Venus in First, but at the same time, he can write songs like Rock and Roll and Sweet Jane, and they will all end up being amazing. Lou had found his style, and with the help that he got from Dog Yule, he managed to make one of my favorite classic rock albums ever. Now, despite Lou finally being able to write his songs, he wasn't in total control of the band. The label still owed them. After they finished recording Loaded, apparently the label decided to mix the album in a way that Lou wasn't really a fan of, and that finally led to him quitting the band. 23rd of August 1970, Lou Reed quits the Velvet, and three months later, the label releases their last studio album, Loaded. A year later, Sterling Morrison decided to quit the band as well, 
so that meant that none of the original members of the Velvet Underground were in the band anymore. There was another studio album released under their name, called Squeeze. But yeah, it's not really their album, is it? Berlin Morrison decided to become a tugboat captain, while Mo, the drummer, just quit music and got married in Arizona. John Cale continued experimenting with avant-garde and classical music, and as I said before, collabed with Lou Reed. Despite Lou's attempts, none of the band's work ever reached commercial success, but it was his solo work who ended up revealing this amazing band to a lot of people. After the end of the band, Lou started working with people like David Bowie and Brian Eno, who were aware of his work since the Velvet days, and he actually had a pretty rich discography. That is a story for another video. In the end, the Velvet Underground never really got appreciated when they were active, but later their work got recognized as a pretty important part of rock history, as they truly deserved. Let me know what you guys thought of the Velvet Underground, and what is your favorite album or song of theirs. I don't know when exactly, but I am going to make a video where I go over Lou Reed's whole discography. But I hope you enjoyed this one first. Let me know what other topics you want me to talk about in the future, and subscribe. Also, give me money on Patreon! <laughs>